All right, we are recording. Uh, welcome to You Talking with Greg. I'm super excited to have my friend, uh, Tim Adelin here and uh, fellow surveyor of the philosophical landscape and uh, curator of voicecraft. Is it, is it, that's the, that's that where, correct. where it is yeah. now? That's correct, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. welcome, Tim. Thanks so much for joining uh, me and for this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Greg. It's good to be here. Nice to have a line I can put on a bio somewhere, surveyor of philosophical landscape. Yes, nice. indeed. That sounds, uh, <laughs> that, that, and actually, so along those lines, yeah, just to, why don't you share a little bit about your journey into this space and what you have been trying to do and what you've been seeing and uh, just kind of where what your reflections are uh, these days. Jesus. Um <laughs> Oh, I always find myself in some stage of feeling quite in touch with that and then other times not so in touch with it. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I think the journey probably looks like, oh, Jesus, you are a psychologist after all. That <laughs> makes me immediately go to, <laughs> to childhood. But um, it, probably, it probably looks like... Tell me about your mother, like a, Tim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she's very conventional, and okay, um, okay. yeah, I'm not particularly conventional, <laughs> although I can sound like it in some contexts. And uh, I think probably some sort of combination of profound mistrust of authority, uh, leading to a very powerful seeking mm. journey um, mm. that led me into philosophy, ultimately into academia to some degree. I eventually right. finished a master's in philosophy after attending a bunch of universities. Mm. And um, I haven't I've been out of that for about six years or so. Mm -hmm. And I sort of realized throughout that um, recursively that what was really drawing me was something much more... Um, I don't know, kind of like in the moment, meaning laden uh, mm. kind of mm -hmm. conscience on the line mm. in some sense, um, right. full being on the line kind of uh, seeking um, in relationship to, to reality and, and the nature mm -hmm. of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so um, mm. I sort of recognized that communication about most things that mattered, most things that sort of uh, destabilized the psyche and, and, and fill us with uncertainty and, and doubt, um, they're difficult things to talk about and that we don't really have much of a skill set to talk about these well together distributed in our nice. culture, certainly not in my family. And, um, and I don't think for my part, at least in my experience in the academic institutions I was a part of, the, the grad departments and the philosophy oh. departments. Oh, really? I thought academia just <laughs> totally relaxed with these issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. So, um, so I, I thought, well, I, that, that world is, is not for me in so many ways. And yet I want to be involved, as I still do, I want to be involved um, such that my w whatever in me that has that that can sense a kind of authenticity um, or commitment to the transformation of really consciousness together mm -hmm. in some yes. way that's open to being yep. in touch with reality that that I could mm -hmm. sense that that was being offered and and thereby in some sense really develop the kind of peer type relationships and mentor type relationships with people and minds and hearts who I consider to be uh, really, um, so, you know, Zach Stein's uh, term, uh, teacherly authority, really deserving of that teacherly authority and really capable of collaborating and therefore, and, and to look at that at the context of that. So not only who are the people, what are the processes by which I can come to understand who these people are, but, but also what is the context and rhythm of gathering so that we can actually become more than what we are individually and Beautiful. nevertheless contemplate the, the nature of things and, and perhaps what ought, ought we do about them. Something like that um, mm. drives me. That's really, that's, let's take a second here and just appreciate that. I, I think that's a very, 
uh, I was reminded of Rory Bashkar talking about the importance of seriousness, you know, because, hmm. um, you know, he, he was critiquing much of academia uh, and was like, you know, there's just, there's a, you want to, to be both authentic and serious, you know, like, we're like, what, like, and, and I found myself um, often saying, well, what is, what does this mean in relationship to our real life? <laughs> <laughs> right, mm -hmm. you know, like, how, what's the connection between this academic shit and what I do embodied in my life? You know, I need that. I definitely need that. Um, so anyway, those are just some of the associations that I have, and I just have. I just want to honor. To me, that's an unbelievable question that cannot be overlooked, um, and it's a shame that I think there's a shell of a lot of activity in which it is overlooked, in which it's denied, or or shuttled to the side, or that's not what we're doing here. We're doing something professional or whatever, but then it's hollow. So the mm -hmm. insistence on seriousness and authenticity and realness and the consciousness erasing of it, I just want to honor that because I think that's an unbelievably crucial, um, you know, kind of accountability of what the fuck we're doing. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I, I appreciate that. Like it struck me as you were saying that there's, so one of the things and I remain interested in, and I, this is pretty broad is just um, intuition, what that means and what that is. And um, there's something about the analytic discussion of, for example, intuition, particularly in those more sterile contexts where authenticity and seriousness isn't quite allowed at the fore that it's very, I think, very easy to lose touch with the, the touch and the feeling that is the very interest that we have in, in understanding what things like intuition are. And so how that then relates to the intellect and what that means in relation to deeper metaphysical theories about the world becomes something that's altogether uh, was for me very difficult to um, it was very difficult to discuss you know, in academia with the professors I happen to have. Yeah, no, I think, well, I think, I don't know that they're unusual at that level. I think I got mm -hmm. very lucky um, and realized actually quite unusual, the combination of my desire for theory and deep philosophical and really physical and metaphysical sort of analytic reflection is also paired with a feminine and feminist therapist heart uh, in mm. me. Um, and I can see my history. If I had just gone into engineering or some philosophy without also working with real people in the therapy room, the vulnerability with which I've been taken to intellectualizing everything um, and losing touch with the authentic real of, of relation, of suffering, of being itself and be channeled into more and more sort of obsessive analytic quasi autistic analysis at some other mm -hmm. level um, that's disconnected from the real, the nature of being a therapist, uh, you know, maintain my contact uh, with, with that. And I feel very, you know, lucky. Uh, and I too often see, you know, the failure of disconnect. So that's, I have a deep appreciation for your bridging that and insisting on it in a particular way. And I believe that mm -hmm. it's absolutely central for us to revitalize uh, you know, I, I, the, um, the saying that I'm offering in like the first 20 or so blogs, we'll see if it gets old or not, but this I'm committed to the first uh, of these podcasts uh, is as at some point I'll, I introduce a saying. So I'll introduce it here and see if you want to riff off of it. Sure. Because it speaks to the issue of um, at least some of the you talk uh, vision in my own journey. And I think it would speak to yours. And so um, the, the mission here is I'm in search of or seeking a coherent naturalistic ontology that, to, that can revitalize the human soul and spirit in the 21st century. So that's, that's, that's sort of my, that's the journey here. And to me, when I was listening to your story, it's sort of like, hey, there's analytic stuff. It's the connection between the authentic experience, our soul and spirit in relationship to analysis and how, you know, what are we doing in relationship to that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful mission, vision. The first thing that, that strikes me, there's two things that kind of come at once. Uh, the first is that I also feel the urge to 
flip that sentence on itself and to have the coherent naturalism be informed, be revitalized by the soul and the, the heart and the spirit. So I, I, I can see them going both ways. And then, and then the other thing is more of like an, an intellectual um, seeking of the, the way that um, uh, you're holding the, the definition of naturalism in relation to supernaturalism. I would, if sort of, I mean, I, I just, I just see these things defined different ways. Like I see some philosophers, mm-hmm. for instance, define naturalism in a way that excludes certain theories of consciousness mm. for like sort of lumps them in the same category as a kind of hand wavy kind of desire to appeal to a, like a black box of some weird metaphysical axiom that we don't understand. And that is actually mm-hmm. making sense of everything for us. And so we don't really have to have a coherence to our overall way of um, voicing our relationship to reality and right. that I don't go so much for. Um, so maybe how do you, Me how neither. do you define that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I mean, right. yeah. So I love, first off, I love the way you flip that in, in terms of um, because and to me, they're essentially the, you know, I am in terms of my own framing, my own metaphysical worldview, uh, I consider myself, uh, and I can trace my uh, development this way. I'm raised as an atheist. Okay. So my, my family's atheistic, um, and now sort of in the modern atheistic sense of really Richard Dawkins is where I start. Interestingly, my dad had a Billy Graham conversion as a young adulthood. So he was in steeped in, steeped in evangelical Christianity. Uh, and then over a decade long period, sort of the light went out. Uh, and so he had concretized belief in evangelical beliefs and then lost those evangelical beliefs and then transitioned into academia and atheism and became a professor of history. And my mom sort of was kind of neutral in some ways and not in, and didn't lead one way or other in atheism or Christianity. But the consequences of my dad's evolution then meant I was brought up in an atheistic structure, okay? And, and believed then, oh, we had evolved into science because we woke up and realized that Santa Claus doesn't live in the sky, you know? And that was, the, you know, and, and so um, that's what I thought the mature view was. And then over time, uh, I transitioned into an atheistic agnostic view. So then, and what I mean by that is, yeah, I'm only atheistic in relationship to the concretized claims of God, that childlike claims of God <laughs> that many religions really don't make, but I learned in my Dawkins essence that they all did, but I was naive, you know, was like that's what I thought religion had to be. And it's like, no, that's a bastardized version of Christianity <laughs> that you're actually critiquing. So then I was like, well, actually, I'm agnostic about the ultimate nature of the universe. You know, I don't know. Um, the nature of science would be you don't really know. You're commit to certain kinds of things. Um, and my scientific analysis commits me to naturalism in some ways. There's a methodological naturalism. And I believe sort of an ontological naturalism that gives rise to the potential for coherence, like to make mm-hmm. sense. You know, a dualistic worldview struggles on philosophical grounds uh, Mm -hmm. to be coherent. You know, you Mm -hmm. you struggle with that. And then actually I become a (laughs) synthist. So Alexander Bard, you know, uh, Mr. Bard, Bard, you know, who I just had, who's the guy who was on you talking in the episode before you is Bard. Oh, wow. Jesus, yeah, imagine uh, following yeah. Alexander Bard. What a there brilliant, you go. You're, what a brilliant there thinker. <laughs> so anyway, me and Bard are doing our thing. And, and so I got stuck into Bard's web and realized, of course, I believe in the concept of God. <laughs> right? You know, I was like, uh, and, and then, I mean, the whole idea, and I'd already fallen into the garden, um, you know, and realized that really this, this is just a naive either or, a naive you know, traditional view of God and then a naive atheism uh, and now actually a deconstructed postmodernism. And I want a metamodern synthesis across the strengths of all of those positions. Um, And so, you know, I fell from the tree of knowledge into the garden. There's a bridge then obviously in relationship to the logos into the mythopoetic and a reestablishing of much better relations between the cultures of sciences and humanities, including rich and sophisticated theology. 
you know, I got hooked up in Zach Stein's world. I returned to Integral with much more appreciation than my initial place. And then I realized, yes, the concept of God um, is unbelievably crucial and has, uh, I was also influenced by uh, Aslan, Aslan's book, Aslan's book, um, The God, A Human History, um, which came out, I think, in 2018. But it revealed the possibility that the earliest civilization temples were, were as a function of people building temples, okay? And the way in which the temples got larger and larger, they had to be year-round and maintain year-round. So the argument actually then is, is that the desire to show fidelity to a God, to, uh, to seek transcendence and to show commitment to that actually led the need for agriculture and year-round civilization, which then means that the concept of God was actually the, a potential trigger, at least this is a plausible argument, that the concept of God triggered us into modern civilization. You know? So you put it in those terms and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, you know, if I'm not making any ontological commitments, but if I just look at the ways in which individuals engage in the world and what God might mean and what it does mean, the idea of God at the very least means to humanity, um, I, that, that frame has got to be taken into consideration um, and, re, and the narrative needs to be reworked uh, between uh, the theological understanding and the scientific understanding and, and so people like Bard and, and John Verbeke mm -hmm. and really John Verbeke and I, I think are basically are almost identical uh, ontological grounds and frames for these kinds of uh, pictures. So it's a really been fascinating to sync up and start to cultivate new visions uh, for the relationships between these concepts. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so many threads there. Uh, just a, a short one that comes to mind is to affirm from my experience and seeing the importance of um, leaders uh, or sort of holders of power in a particular group or society to ultimately have allegiance to something that is beyond themselves yes. for the whole, for the whole group, totally. for the whole pattern of relationality, I suppose the ecology uh, without that, there's something, um, well, I suppose something fundamentally corrupt about totally. the nature of that power hierarchy. And so, I definitely see how the concept of God in many traditions is going to play that, that kind of role. And, um, and I've noticed in myself um, that, that it, it is that, that there's something in me that's seeking to trust someone who I perceive to be of in a, so for example, I'd tell a little story. I don't know if it's okay mm -hmm. to mention um, yeah. sort of psychedelic journeys on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I've had them. Um, <laughs> Took a lot of yeah. grass to go to the garden, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Sorry, exactly. Know, I think we're in a mature audience here. So. Yeah, all manner of plants in the garden. That's for yes, sure. Yes, indeed. Um, so I was on a uh, journey with um, San Pedro and mushrooms with a group Ooh. of about 30 people. And it wow. was over the course of about 24 hours. Okay. And uh, we were walking through the mountains and there did so happen to be a leader convener of this, of this group, someone I, yeah. I trusted a lot. Mm -hmm. um, even if the attitude of this person was not that, Hey, I'm the leader guys, you know, like we were all in there together, but to me, it was quite clear. Someone sort of had a plan. They knew the land they were, they knew all the people they were taking care of everyone. Right. And, um, we shared a moment together, mm. uh, face to face with a, a very, very large boulder. Hmm. Yeah. And, um, there was something about, Something about my pressing my head against that boulder. There was a couple of things that were happening, which were quite interesting. Mm. Uh, the, the, this person that was next to me, they were to my sensing very much authentically engaged with a kind of praising and a veneration of what that boulder represented 
they sort of had quite like a, what felt like quite an active symbolic connection yep. to it. And there may, may be things about the beliefs involved, which not everyone would, would uh, agree with or find coherent necessary, necessarily, although some people might. Mm -hmm. But there's something about the, the veneration of the geography in this case, something that will outlast us so much that we yes. are just children like the ants and the spiders, which were right. all over totally. it, were just like, we are just to, to that thing. Yes. And so there was something about the veneration in that sense, veneration of the ancestors yep. um, and, and time, yeah. which, which seems to be important. Yeah, I actually love the saying, I stole it from a big history conference I was at, be a good ancestor. And I've seen her mm -hmm. since, but it's a, it really captures, you know, this transcendent ego, you know, cost time, places yourself. And in fact, I, I try to, you know, if I say I'm going to be aligned with the concept of God, another way of saying that is I'm going to try to be oriented to being a good ancestor. That means that, you know, mm -hmm. the thread of energy information I'm leaving behind is part of a weave as part of a totality that far supersedes me and will outlast me. My hope is to be part of it and oriented into something that would be you know toward the good mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay so so i wonder where this i mean as if one wanted to be sort of i say cynical but sort of pragmatic with their mm -hmm. anthropological psychological analysis one could say something like um it's adaptive from the perspective of leaders maintaining their position in the group and perhaps adaptive for the coherence of the group as such for there to be this sort of enerate veneration of that which is beyond just the narcissistic yep. inchoate confines of the leader and um, one could possibly make the case that this is some sort of evolved behavior, societal behavioral yep. disposition that maybe sure. comes about X amount of tens of thousands of years ago, but was something that was emergent. And what we can say about the nature of that veneration of the whole in that way, previous to that emergence, all of a sudden we have to start bringing in different levels of analysis and how that, how that, transformation how that leap is made in what in what that disposition is or what is occurring there becomes well i'm interested like what your voicing of that is if you can sort of see the thread i'm trying to pick up sure i mean uh, for me what you're articulating there is we can drop into a scientific ontology perspective right the science ontology tries to describe what is an ought and an unfolding wave of causality um, that's, you know, basically disconnected from morality and ethics, uh, although to do science isn't, but it's essentially the, the, the gold standard of science is to drop out of any it ought claims and any subjective value claims and perspective, and then try to create a coherent narrative in the unfolding wave of cause. Um, and so, I mean, what you were echoing there is like a Brett Weinstein view of religion, I would say or at least aspects of what he would try to articulate from an evolutionary biological perspective. I'd have slightly different narrative and nuance perhaps, but really the stance of like, okay, I'm just gonna describe the unfolding wave of causality, the evolution of cultural processes from us as primates into persons and then what catches and then belief systems and how do belief systems you know, hook on and then how are they led and what leads them to grow and become meme plexes that people believe in versus those that don't. Um, I think we want to be able, for me, I want a behavioral social science stance that is kind of disconnected and offers some of that, um, but not as the ontology. It's, it's a language game you play when you do science. What I mean by that is you, it's a particular set of rules that afford a particular kind of statements of claims that you know, are valuable and have particular kinds of ontological strengths but they also are unbelievably weak in other ways. And they're definitely not a coherent theory of everything is not science from my vantage point at all. It's a particular mm -hmm. kind of epistemological frame um, that's useful, but incomplete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been um, contemplating some of your ideas uh, since you reached out to me, I think maybe just about a year ago. Yeah. And um, yeah. And I, 
I fully expect to be doing so for, for many years to come. And I, I, I get the feeling that the kind of conversation we could have today and are having is from my angle, at least something that I will um, hopefully imp improve my capacity to articulate my angle on it. And it will take me, I think probably a number of decades because there's, <laughs> There's, there's this, there's something I, there's something I'm so curious to get at. Mm -hmm. And I notice how much, um, like a couple of things, one, how much energy it's calling from me to, to voice and presence. Yep. Um, and also the, it's, it's, um, it's quite a careful line I have to tread because mm. the level of clarity sort of making the initial movements into such a such a broad framing is so important because i i can't i can't summon that clarity from loads of different angles maybe right. there's been right. only a few moments not a few moments but there's some affective core yes. of way i find my own steps right. in the garden right. so to speak right right, right. something like this mm. um but I'm, I'm happy to, I'm, I'd love to give it a go because it's a, it's yeah, a bloody no, gonna, privilege to talk to you about this stuff. It really absolutely. is. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, I, it, likewise. And now all of a sudden, yes, I'm like, uh, let me see that energy of intuition. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, it's in short supply for me. I, so it's very interesting. Mm. I, I, I see how it's um, like, I, I seem to be someone who, I, I can summon quite a lot of it and then it takes a lot out of me. It takes a lot. It's like a performance kind of thing, you okay. know, especially mm -hmm. when there's an, when there's an audience type dynamic, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's like every, every time one seeks to like tap into the, like to really give to the flow of kind of con conscience with, with an mm -hmm. aesthetic disposition while also attempting to speak truthfully. Mm -hmm. That's a lot takes a lot and also it's like it would be different if i you know whatever i'm about to say if i come back to this and say the exact same thing i'm not going to be quite biting into the ineffable from that authentic place right, right? right. so it's right. kind of like right. a one-time thing um because i mean at the core of all of this we we're we're seeking to speak about it's, it's really the, the, the continued dance between the ineffability of transformation and what we can coherently say about mm -hmm. that journey we're all on together so that right. we can be good ancestors, so that we can extend invitations we can actually fulfill and that we're not right. just pushing people towards cliffs, you know. <laughs> right. Amen. Or that. worse. <laughs> or worse. So, good. so... So dancing, dancing that line, I think of, I think of what it is like something I've been so interested in, in a, you know, profound states of consciousness and just finding myself seeking to voice my way down, like with and through kind of existential angst and all that, that concern for, for finitude and failure and just finding oneself at sort of rock bottom again. Like, why mm -hmm. the fuck bother with this? What am I? What is going on? You know, mm -hmm. what am I responsible for? Mm -hmm. um, but also how that can sort of appear as sort of from that place where inner coherence is obliterated and the, and the choice becomes something like affirming affirming life and mm -hmm. and the vitality and the worthwhileness of the opportunity for experience itself in relationship right. to and a, and a and like a kind of on the one hand an abyss and another hand right. kind of chaos of too much when you're when you're in that yep. kind of state right so and and but it's some but but the the appearance like these these domains of experience like mm -hmm. the our utter confusion in this regard, like the the nature of what is absent our frames of reference and how we orient in relationship to that, like orient on our own, in what way am I bullshitting myself and how we get caught up in that is so fundamental yes. to all of this for me. And what I've heard in a couple of your conversations, there's a way of, of thinking and framing you have, which really accords with some fundamental um, experience and some of my own Mm. writing um you speak about a sort of an, an orientation um uh 
towards or away from, and then a kind of passive and active versions of these things. And in some kind of um, poetic language of my own expression, uh, in response to some of the most fundamentally um, profound and obliterating, in some sense, pure and innocent mm -hmm. kinds of experience I've had, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the, the, the orientations, the modes of orientation of confrontation and surrender, broadly this coming towards a kind of bearing myself, like walking right up to the edge of my boundary and right. holding the kind of truth of, hang on, being here matters, mm -hmm. involved, real, mm -hmm. yeah, like moving towards and and the, we can see like at another level, like a positive version of that. It's like, yes, like you are real. What you are matters. You have something to add, but right. you know, you overstep that boundary too much. You hold on too tight. You've got that egotism, that narcissism. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping a kind of a bunch of levels here from yeah, the no, I'm tracking though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the, and then the surrender being a kind of allowing within and ultimately giving way to the, the flow of another, the, having one's own boundaries in some sense being ingressed on, but mm. appropriately so, mm -hmm. or inappropriately so, um, because one has not in fact held to what their, their mm. nature is. Mm. And I think of something like that, those modes of orientation as being like, when I consider, the, mm. when I consider the, the nature, like the functioning of cells, when I consider the possibility for coherence yep. between self, other and world itself, yep. mm -hmm. I, something of this, like how it, how it binds, how there can Beautiful. be coherence and continuity. Right. These modes seem to me very important. And I see yes. that as like, a th like a fundamental through line, yes. right? A th through like goes, that goes, maybe it goes as deep as it goes. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of where I'm at and, and a way that I seek, like with that kind of language feel, I have some sort of bridge between like the profoundly mystical in some sense. And yeah. at the same time, that which is seeking a kind of coherent, maybe even naturalistic kind of expression of things. Beautiful. Damn. And uh, that, that, no, that, that, okay. So, um, so for me, what you you're describing a core intuitive process, you know, which at, at the core, at the primate level, you know, we're obviously we're carrying person-based justifications, but really, to me, what you're describing is you're trying to get the raw, dynamic, experiential, existential, you know, forces, flavors, and counterbalances is what 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 informs that at its particular sort of existential rawness. That's what I'm hearing in relation. And then, mm -hmm. you know, what is that? And what does that mean about A, as it, as it informs to me, then what you, then the question is, well, here's the question I would have. You could uh, the sort of questions like, well, what is that, <laughs> right? At one level, you can just sort of analyze that. And then is that, is there a spiritual dimension to that that is transcendent at some level? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's like, and w whatever, it, w whatever it is in us, which is, it's like that, that it's like the essence of discernment, like deep mm -hmm. involvement fundamentally, yep. like that, that it matters, like the participation matters. And that nah, it, it that seems yes. to me like I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never been able to, to properly grok how it could be that something of that orient that discerning orientation at, could be in, like radically mer emergent such that before and I, and I'm not even sure how to make sense of before but such okay. a, but mm -hmm. that before there's there's nothing of a kind of involvement like mm -hmm. a, almost like a kind of an orientation basis of choice mm -hmm. there's nothing of that and then all of a sudden there's something of that because mm -hmm. if there's all of a sudden something of that then then i'm curious about the dynamics of i suppose that the kind of the dynamics of that self organization the dynamics right. of that self making yep. and to what degree we are we are fundamentally just in in a kind of like 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 you know uh, we're puppets on the end of a string mm. and it's it like it because it, how 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 does our participation matters matter if it doesn't fundamentally, if it doesn't have a basis in fundamentally mattering. Mm. Right, there's lots of different threads I could go there, but let's end, let me pull on the last one. 
when you say mm-hmm. fundamentally mattering, what's your reference point there? What fundamentally mattering? Um, I I mean that the the through line of that discernment is not floating on top of something that doesn't give a damn one way right. or another okay. right. what gotcha. that discernment okay. is doing. All right. All right. Right. I think that's, I mean, to me, that's one, you know, this is the great, uh, this is the great kind of naturalist, spiritualist question. Mm-hmm. I mean, intellectually, that, that to me mm-hmm. on a problem level. So the theorist side of me finds this to be, you know, uh, and, and certainly has wrestled with and has narrative about, well, yeah, this is, there's a, comp- the emergence of complexification can afford pretty clear articulations about where this phenomenological experience of soul, you know, and how it operates this way. And, that, and it certainly didn't pop into existence like from yesterday to today, that's for sure, at least it, in the broad scheme of things. But at the same time, uh, so there's the, my naturalistic side and then there's my humanistic side, which is always like hopeful, open and questioning. So these are my two dialectics. Um, that the, the humanistic side is always pushing the envelope toward the possibility uh, you know, of the existence of, say, spirit as some ontological entity, and then whether you'd actually be able to find it <laughs> for my naturalistic mm-hmm. side to see <laughs> mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. comprehend. That's my own, this, so this is my own, uh, I'm now problem of formulating, formulizing this in terms of problem space here, which is mm-hmm. a little different than the being-ness mm-hmm. of itself. But that's, I'm just, that's where I am in relation. Yep. Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, yeah, it's what, so, so from where I'm, from where I'm sitting, one thing I, one thing I want to avoid from an intellectual perspective is um, just following a line of thinking because I want it to be the case based on some internal monologue as to uh, what, what grounds my sustainable meaning and being in the world. That would be, that would be an error. Um, the, it, it, it's, a, it's such an interesting one though, because the, the, re, like the first thing is that the, re, the, the resuscitation of my will to life <laughs> um <laughs> it rely on, like like it there's a well to go to and that well is is beyond or mm-hmm. other than the articulations that are sort of the, the articulating question itself that's driving me and yet yeah. they they're woven together immediately as I begin to co- express and be in coherent relationship to that thing. And so in some sense, my experiential basis, I'm, I'm trusting that essentially, despite how incorrect my words may be, that I am willing to let go of whatever those words mm-hmm. are mm. trapping me into in order to do the thing that mm. I'm seeking to articulate with my words. Mm-hmm. And yet, and yet there's, there remain the intellectual questions. Cause I can totally see how I can totally see th- these different epochal stages of complexity and that the, all the various ways we can make sense of our relationship to transformation and the kind of, um, mm this this changing of ourselves in relation to this these boundary thresholds that we mm-hmm. continually undergo mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um i can see how that that takes on a just a drastically drastically different richness and um complexity when we talk about culture and when we talk mm. about consciousness and mind at the level of human mm. beings and all the right. different kinds of self-reference we have in relationship to hierarchical goal structures that themselves are balancing all these dynamic concerns. There's so much richness. Mm. And then, and then you go back through the animal kingdom and, you know, obvious, you know, you, you see that, that complexity changing and, and then you wonder, well, 
when we talk at the level of chemistry or we talk at the level of physics or we talk at the level of what physics cannot talk about, but is trying yeah. to, it's like, <laughs> how do we make sense then of this kind of this orientation in consciousness or something like this? Yeah. And all of a sudden the language that we can summon to, to speak kind of in, in, on the one hand that speaks truthfully to our poetic relationship to how this transformative process shows up right. in our own worlds and the nature of the models that we're speaking about becomes that's such a large gap. And, mm. and I think we, you know, having humility in the face of that is certainly very important. And yet I, and, and yet I continue to think that something about the nature of self-organization, self-making, like the relationship between self, other, and world, that like the, the essence of like coherence, like for there to be, and interact like a fusion between things or interaction or relationship. We're yep. left with a kind of baseline conceptual necessity to even make sense of anything at all. And then I, and then I just consider like, what, what's like, then I am just left looking at metaphysical vitality of a kind of Elan Vital of a life will, like mm. why movement? Like what, the, like why the fuck at all? Like, let's just, like just naming the thing as something, something seems to be happening. And whatever that yeah. something is necessarily, we can say without any intellectualizing or necessarily continues to infuse me. Right. Yeah. Or I wouldn't be it. And I'm continuous with it in some, but distinct. It's like, so on, on, at one level, I really don't care because I know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, it, totally. like, absolutely. So I don't know, man. It's such, a, yeah. I, it's such a beautiful set of, it's such a conundrum, a question. I think there's important things to say regarding, for instance, like it, you, talking about narrative and teleology and, for example, how we relate to ourselves in relationship to these big questions and big yeah. positions becomes so important because- totally the concerns for example that john raises so frequently uh, around the, the the fixation of of teleology for instance mm. and the, and the finalization of a story that's missing something more like it, it's not able to to really um hold or or make sense of the continual need like the ongoingness right. of relevance realization and the ongoing right. of transformation with respect to the novelty and potentiality in existence like this is very crucial and we are in a position where our stories seem to need to adapt to the this relationship with potentiality but that doesn't to me um remove all uh, you know, value from, and I'm not saying John's arguing this at all, um, but I'm not saying this, like this doesn't remove the, 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 the relevance still of teleology, that there can in fact be a, a whole of a picture that we can, a new whole, like to be perpetually remade that can nevertheless yep. ground this through line of participation somehow. Totally. Like, no, I mean, this is a beautiful, that's exactly, this is the, this is, I mean, to me, this is the 21st century philosophical task right here. This is the, mm -hmm. the entanglements and, and the issues. And um, I, and I believe we can get, I, I believe ultimately it's a really positive story to tell on all this, you know? Yeah. It's a really positive story yeah. to tell on all this. Yeah, well, we need positive bloody stories. Hey, I don't always feel it so positively. It's such, it's like, it's, it's like it, but, but it, there's something that's there. Um, just recently in a conversation we were having inside a voicecraft.network, which is, mm. you know, an attempt to, which is a just bringing together people who are interested yep. in philosophical yes. and existential right. inquiry. I signed on. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, into, <laughs> into a, into, uh, you know, holes in formation of collective participation and understanding something like right. this. And one of the, the, the topics recently that we've been themes we've been, exploring is the relationship between you know um consciousness and genes and something of that evolutionary story where you have the incessant desire for the replication at any cost as long as that cost it doesn't deny the the actual the the that replication to occur mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that persistence to occur in that regard mm -hmm. and then on the and and all of the uh amoral uh, you know, um, from what our perspective, uh, horrendous type actions, that mm. mentality, that, uh, that 
desire can mm-hmm. uh, and does, you know, um, do, uh, how to relate, like what, like the, the self-reflectiveness we have, the, the consciousness we can bring to bear on the nature of what we are from the perspective of that, which is just looking to persist and mm-hmm. perpetuate mm-hmm. itself across time. Like upon, upon what is that consciousness really grounding itself? Is there actually something more fundamental about the nature of being as such, about the cosmos as such, which we can be in dedication to, which yeah. is actually more fundamental than, than just the, the, you know, a kind of up, up here abstracted articulation sure. of desire for replication. And I think maybe that there is a story we can tell about that. I but, think but I want that, that story, if that's not more fundamental than just the kind of, well, we're fundamentally just replicating things that don't give a fuck. It's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, maybe, maybe we do have to acknowledge that, but, but, what, but what is it that we, what is it in us that is able to acknowledge that and care otherwise? Totally. That's yeah. Well, I mean, these are questions. I've, I mean, <laughs> very something. It's totally something because obviously, you know, many people, you know, even Steve Pinker's like, my genes can go jump in a lake. <laughs> hey, if Steve Pinker's gene can kill, can un- un- unplug his genes, then clearly something's going on. We should ask him to prove it. <laughs> Prove it, Steve. Because uh, well, it Coffee was in good, the brother. context of like I don't think he has any children, so he was basically saying, you know, I, I chose not to have children, right. and you know, there it is. And so, yeah, the, I think that we want to be very clear, and and certainly, I think some of the ontology and metaphysics of the tree of knowledge does help clarify. I think we're vulnerable to ontological reductions that are inelegant, um, and I think modernity. The scientific materialism of modernity is um, inelegant and it gets us framing around reduction in unsophisticated and non-dynamic ways. Um, and that's a problem. That's one of the, that's one of mm-hmm. the, we definitely need an upgrade in our fundamental understanding of science writ large. That's certainly one of my, mm-hmm. um, I'm convinced of that given my own journey on what kind of big picture view of science actually works <laughs> as opposed mm-hmm. to, you know, what you are held or given um, from a, you know, the standard view, which is a clunky and inelegant system that actually doesn't even solve the some basic jump problems, like what the hell we mean by mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. So, so there's a system of science that's broken. That's my pitch, mm-hmm. you know, that we can fix and upgrade. If you fix and upgrade it, it actually comes a lot closer to uh, validating the metaphysics of our everyday concerns, potentially. It doesn't, uh, uh, you know, unlike what the eliminative materialists and many other reductive people say, they completely miss the boat on what the um, connection to what a clear and coherent scientific model says about what people care about, what they are, what their essences are. Like, for example, mm-hmm. like, it's not that we're gene replicators, it's we're justifying apes, people. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you are, okay? Yeah, you know, so replication and survival at the level of life, but then you get in a primate, you're a behavioral investor that cares about active, passive, pleasure, pain, self, other shit, to get into some of your reference points at an intuitive primate level. And then you're a person justifier that sits atop that and says, hey, this is why I'm right. <laughs> this is why it's important to me. This is what we ought to do, okay? So you're, you're basically yeah. have a down, you know, ready to download the mean plex of whatever society you are and generate narratives. So your nature is to justify. Now it's, a, it's blank in terms of the content of that justification, but what the unified theory says is no, you're a justifying eight, that's what you do. And what it orients you to is not to then try to reduce you to mechanical behavioral matter cause, but underlying natural behavioral processes like processes of justification. Uh, that's, that's the actual scientific description of what we do. And then with that, you can then say, oh yeah, that's actually what people do. <laughs> and that's actually pretty close to actually how they care. You know, it's like, and so you can jump mm-hmm. from what science says in a scientific ontology into a humanistic ontology um, with not a lot of shifts. That's what my whole, kind of the whole unified theory of psychology, unified psychotherapy is, is there's a lot more connection it, on the ground of what science on its own terms could do and what our own values are as general normal human beings that wouldn't want to hurt somebody 
and want to promote well-being. There's a lot more coherence there. And then if we get that coherence clean, that will clear up a lot of fucking confusion. And then we can really ask these questions about, well, there's a naturalist ontology and maybe the whole goddamn thing is God <laughs> or something, right? You know, then you really get into deep spiritual transcendence questions like why are all the Eastern traditions saying it basically reduces to spirit in a certain way? What are all these weird mental phenomena? You know, this, this is, you know, is it, these are great, we'll never answer them. We will die as far as I'm concerned. I mean, maybe we'll answer them in the affirmative. You'll never prove that it's not the case. We'll all die sort of agnostic at that edge, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. You know, you couldn't mm. be, you can't be scientifically certain that that's not true. You can have a mm. belief, but that's not the nature of actually scientific justification. That's not it at all. You can always change based on new data. You could find a fifth force that actually, nope, there is actually some underlying force and we actually detect that and our minds connect and actually there is something that's sending out a beacon of that force and that's God or whatever. And then it's like, or an underlying spiritual radiant that actually explains a huge amount of what people have been saying their whole lives that we were blind to. That will always be possibly to be discovered. Mm. Mm. Oh. Yeah. So one image coming to me is something of the, 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 the evolution or progression of uh, an always revitalizing art that inspires the continual transformation of this very question nice. posed in different language as well. Yeah. And, and then and and that and that's something that that the that the involve that the involvement the participation in the ultimately what looks to me like the collective creation of yep. this art yep. becomes then um like a like a, a really high and deep and broad drive and reason for being together um and but 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 one that doesn't um D uh, diminish or obliterate or, or like a kind of reduce away the the tragic suffering involved in the pursuit of that art <laughs> um, at all yep. um, and that nevertheless inspires so that's one image that's one image that's, that's a beautiful image and that to me that to, that's the we my hope when I say that I'm hopefully you know I'm also scared of shit by the way I'm looking I, my wherever I'm sitting it's like Oh, over there's heaven and maybe there's real hope and over there's hell and there's real likelihood of that. So the horizon to me of our human situation um, feels there's a Kairos of the moment to borrow John. You know, John's getting me up to speed on Greek. <laughs> yeah. Kairos of the yeah. moment. You know, this is not the Kronos. Yeah. This is a major domain. Um, and the, what we do now has lots of variance outcome in relationship to the downstream consequences uh, and, you know, the, the outcomes right now are at a, one of these, you know, phase shift points where you can phase shift up and all of a sudden be like, oh, my God, this gets networked together. And there's a, you know, potential consciousness that's awakening. And all of a sudden we wake into our the good sides of our natures, realize that we're so much wealthier than we ever guessed. We can distribute that, create a safety net, foster the kind of growth and connection with each other that then, you know, I'm never going to be utopic, but it's basically like, hey, we can do a lot better than we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other mm -hmm. part of me is like, oh, fuck, we're actually on Titanic. It's already too late. We're going to hit the guy. <laughs> and my kids are whether they're going to be in a society that actually sustains them, even though they're high water, given all their privilege is, you know, maybe not. So that's where fundamentally my my structure lands there. But my yeah. the hope, the analytic and humanistic hopeful side is actually I believe that there's a collective intelligence that's emerging that has the potential to sync up and to achieve an upgrade in our fundamental insight. And if we do that, we can create a resonant understanding. And yep. I can even justify that, I can justify that completely scientifically <clears throat> through like the tree of knowledge. I can also justify it spiritually with the empirical transformation. And I get, an, I get a spiritual charge off of what's called the singularity okay so um there's a i don't know if we talked about this at all i mentioned in a number of different things so the singularity i'm sure you've heard you know there's the uh, the idea of 
There's a technical, sing technological singularity. There's a social singularity. There's all this debate about what the hell singularity is, okay? Mm -hmm. There actually is a pretty simple formulation for what a singularity is. Mathematically, a singularity is just one over X as X goes to zero, okay? So at a basic, you can't divide something by zero, but as X gets smaller and smaller, one goes to basically infinity. That's kind of mm -hmm. what a mathematical singularity is, okay? So now in terms of evolution, a singularity, what, what they track the singularity is they basically did, what is the time it takes for the next big innovation? Okay, it's time between innovation, all right? So if it used to be billions of years and then it's millions of years and then it's thousands of years and then it's hundreds of years and then it gets smaller and smaller as that's, that's X. And then as X goes to zero, okay, you move toward a singularity, all right? So that's a simple mathematical thing. Now here's what's unbelievably miraculous as far as I'm concerned. And my analytical side to me looks at this as like, shit, <laughs> I don't know how to mm -hmm. explain this. Maybe the spiritual guys win this one. <laughs> right? From an analytical point, I mean, this is it. So yeah. in 1997, right? In 1997, me, Mr. Little, you know, atheistic scientist draws out the tree of knowledge, all right? That's what happened to me. I drew the four cones. And then I was like, hey, you know, clearly each one of these cones after matter represents an information processing communication network. That's, that's what cells do. DNA does that. That's what animals do. That's what the nervous system does. And that's what language does for us as people. Okay. It's an information processing communication network. All right. So once you then see that, then it obviously follows, well, is there another one? All right. Well, then once you say, well, is there another information processing communication network that supersedes humans talking to each other, it was crystal clear that the 20th century was laid down the information technology of our technological developments of the internet, of computers and emerging interface, interfaces with that was crystal clear, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, fuck. And I said, I was like, well, 21st century is gonna be a big goddamn deal, okay? And then I started to see that there's a fifth joint point that we were going to we were going to transition through the culture person dimension into some digital virtual. All right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then there's mm -hmm. that. And but now then then I hear about the singularity. So Ray Kurzweil, you know, talks about the technological singularity. And then he interprets that as well. That's when AI and humans will be I mean, AI will transform uh, and we'll have artificial intelligence that supersedes humans. Okay, that's one interpretation. This guy, Max Borders, has the social singularity, which somehow we will wake up to a global consciousness. All those are really mm -hmm. cool. But mm -hmm. I then found a Russian mathematician named Kor Korovev. I can't say his Russian name. So in uh, that, he was a big historian, okay? So mm -hmm. big history is this, which was developed independent of the tree of knowledge, which then says there are these eight thresholds across time and complexity. And then big historians got interested in the ninth threshold, what comes next? And they generally framed it as the technological and social singularity, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so then this Russian guy hears about it and gets involved in big history. Uh, everybody on the, on the, who's been looking at the time till big inventions was a Western scientist. So all of the big inventions were framed in the context of Western uh, history and invention and all of that. And not surprisingly, the Russian world has a totally different set of inventions and people different doing different things. Mm -hmm. So actually now there's another data set on big events and intervention that overlaps only very loosely with the Western data set on big inventions. And you can mm -hmm. apply the same measurement, which is basically the time to the next intervention. And if it's on a curvature of acceleration, the time to next invention will get smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So the Russian mathematician applies a super simple singularity curve to the Russian, to the Eastern Russian and the Western map. Okay. And he argues that Kurzweil, I think very convincingly, he argues that Kurzweil underestimates there's actually, it's a hyperbolic exponential rather than just an exponential. So he tweaks the rate of acceleration with a super simple addition to the formula. And what that means is it's happening faster and faster until you quote, go vertical, okay? Yep. And we can talk about yep. what that would be, but it's getting faster and faster. So then he looks and applies this super simple formula to the West 
and realizes that the thing goes vertical in 2029 with a correlation of like 0.994, which in social science is a, a regression line that correlates at 0.994, almost a 1.0 regression line. It's unheard of in social science. Okay, that's mm. that. Then you go to a separate data set and the it, Russian crosses at 2027, like at 0.996. Okay, totally different data set super simple formulation regarding the evolution of complexity that hits a cultural singularity or, or transcends itself in a particular way sometime between 27, 2029 and 2027, okay? That to me is like, oh my God. Yeah, it's oh my God. That's like, what the hell? What is happening that, that is driving a particular type of, you talk about will or guidance or some intuitive thing towards what's betterment. Some, you know, all of us yammering, justifying apes, talking to each other, building shit is coercing towards some sort of, you know, emergent, you know, phenomenon. And, and that, yep. you know, and, and you can bring science in that. You can say, ah, oh, well, nobody knows this thing. It's not like sky's going to turn purple and there's 6,000 things. And yes, those are all good rightful critical things but the spiritual side of me says jesus you know especially yeah. knowing my own personal world in this that i popped up on the screen had some flash of insight when i'm stoned just draw out a tree of knowledge and just then now been tracing this little baton of energy information into some insight that's now part of some collective thing that's been emerging over eons i don't yeah. know how to explain that <laughs> Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what a, what an incredible, what an incredible articulation that was. Oh yeah. That's uh that's a lot to process. So, okay. I'm, I want to ask that. So the, the words uh, know thyself are coming to me this and I want to ask you about the relationship between justification, the systems of justification and the process of coming to know oneself, yes. the process of coming to know oneself as part of a whole. And well, that's probably enough to start with. Yeah, actually. <laughs> that's probably, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, Right. That's good to stop. Cause that's actually, I mean, you know, often the right thing to do is just ask a good question and sit with it for a little while. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and, and, you know, just to know that it's a good question. I essentially asked that question in 1996 It's six to eight months before the tree of knowledge. And it changed my life in many relations. Okay. I mean, I asked it from a different angle, but essentially here's what, I would say is that we had a primate self concept of some weak sort, okay? But then we layer on top of that this person thing, okay? This explicit self-conscious reflective thing that then lives in a field of justification, all right? Lives, in other words, you get socialized as a kid and your parents and your friends, they do everything, but it's all networked together through a system of justification. You have to learn what you can do. Was the justification field sort of more or less set previous to the capacity to influence it explicitly? Well, it, for us, as we get born, certainly for every individual, yeah. born into a pre-existing field of justification, which as a four-year-old, you just download. Yep. So for those, for those apes with their early self-consciousness, moreover, like, let's say like a couple million year time span, would it still make sense to sort of recognize some sort of psychological, say psychological, some sort of um, coherent dynamics to the, the field of consciousness that was more or less if it was shifting, it was shifting so slowly through implicit and non-explicit changes. And so totally. it didn't so, pop into being. It was just No, so we can we can relevant. actually try I would say we can track this pretty cleanly. Okay. okay. So the other apes probably there's good reason to believe, of course, we're cousins with all existing apes, but the other apes probably haven't changed all that much in the last two or three million years. There's good, you know, five million years. Okay. But, but something happened to our line, 
okay? And, and there were a couple of different things that clearly happened to our line. Um, the first thing that happens to our line is a transformation in our cooperative social, what some people call it, the pro, social proto cell. And what he means by that, this guy, Klaus Anderson, who I'm on a list with, and just actually shared a new paper today, so it's on my head, but I thought it was brilliantly done. But basically what he calls is the socio-ont, which he means by the sociological ontological unit that emerges kind of like a superorganism in humans in ways that are quite different than other uh, great apes, okay? Meaning, what do you mean? The network of cooperation and role and the complex adaptive activity of hunting and gathering together as a unit is qualitatively more sophisticated in terms of coordination and understanding part whole relation and reading the field, okay? And the other piece of information that we can add to this is Michael Tomasello's work on the emergence of uh, uh, implicit pre-linguistic we space, he calls it. The we space is the capacity for intersubjective, implicit intersubjective shared attention and intention, okay? Humans can track other people's attention and intention with a theory of mind that's radically better than others. I mean, by two, three years old, our kids are way better than adult chimpanzees, okay? Uh, classic easy example is pointing. Humans intuit that if you point, you have an intention and I'll track your, and I'll look and I'll look back at you and I'll look and I'll see, okay? So we can sync up in this implicit intersubjective field uh, way better than the other chimps uh, and other great apes. And that affords us then, you know, what music would do, what shared hunting would do, what communal ritual would do prior to any fundamental narrative on top of it. By communal ritual, I mean beat on a drum, engage in some sort of base. Now we know that uh, 500,000 years ago, they weren't doing a lot of symbolic ritual, but they were certainly engaged in a lot of cooperative stuff. We find hunt, uh, fire and we start hunting big game in big sort of ways. You're doing lots of uh, really intense, you know, stuff. And we're probably mimicking each other, engaged in gesture, and then you get broken symbolic communication, like antelope there, you know, and those kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And because we have the implicit intersubjective field and increasing brain, you know, power, our brains are getting bigger, although that's an interesting track in and of itself, but whatever, our capacity for symbolic tagging and shared implicit intersubjective space is clearly up meaning, you know, mm. and, and crucial. And then about a hundred, the argument from justice, then a hundred thousand years ago, we shift from broken symbolic communication into propositional claims. And propositional claims is sort of like going from a distributed nervous system to a brain. I mean, propositional claims fundamentally change the nature of linguistic communication. And then that, mm crowd hooks itself and starts the process of cultural person evolution, the evolution of systems of justification that then, you know, are reference points of narrative and question answer dynamics and all the things that pull our, you know, unique mental capacities uh, into this coordinated form. And then that takes off and, you know, and we're the unbelievable fortunate, you know, John talks about psychotechnologies, well, we built all of these cognitive psychotechnologies. I, mean, I was just yeah. reading my son's uh, articulation of, he's a, in a history of math class, okay? Um, and he was doing the history of Hygens, uh, was a great mathematician and physicist. And he basically was looking at games of chance and built some of the earliest probability average assessment stuff just 500 years ago, okay, about and, and, the, and the difficulty that he had determining what was a fair bet, you know, on a super simple thing. I was just, well, this is fucking just averages. And the whole point is like, actually 500 years ago, the concept of an average even over like mm. five numbers divide by five and give you an average and what that mean would be. I mean, the best mathematicians in the world didn't have a good understanding of probability and stats in that kind of way. That's 500 years ago, you yeah. know, we, and think of, so, so the, my point of it is, is that, yep, we have all of this unbelievable architecture, and then all of a sudden we hook into this propositional question answer dynamic, and then that creates this whole evolution of justification. Uh, that, and that's just now that's, and that's the accelerating singularity curve. And now we're actually at the cusp of potentially making a jump like the talking jump was. 
I mean, that's what yeah. the acknowledges. Yeah. It's like, holy <laughs> shit, we're going through a fifth joint point as we're aware of it. I mean, it's just a bizarre. I mean, to me, whether you're a skeptic or a believer, you have to understand. To me, you have to look at the time. As long as we don't kill ourselves as we go through this chaos, it's just one of the most remarkable and beautiful and confusing but challenging. You know, the existential yep. calling for what it is that. You know, if we, if we don't go insane, if we can rise to the equation of, of occasion of this, it, it's a beautiful to opportunity. Is that at least that's my optimistic call? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, wow, yeah. It's uh, I've I've tried to think about this. Um, so who is the who is the guy? I forget his name. The, the theory of the adjacent possibles. Oh yes, uh, that's uh, Stuart Kaufman. Got you. Yeah. So um, I could be, I could be totally wrong about this. I heard him describe on Jim Rutt's podcast that this accelerating curve of yep. this proximal adjacent possible, just complexifying more possibility, yep. more possibility. He, he, I could be wrong. I thought I heard him describe it as actually going vertical. Yep. He would have. Yeah. He would have talked about a singularity that way. Yeah. And, and vertical is not 0.999 right? It's not asymptotic. That's, we mean, he means vertical, like a well, right what, angle. What right, is it? What, ha what happens is, as X goes to zero, then one, then you, then the line goes vertical. So that, X does actually go to zero. Okay, good. Uh, that, I mean, that's, that's what would make sense. It's, um, it's, if as, you're calling it it's as if now this is, and then it as if. Drops, it's okay. as if, okay. So it's not, and it's not like all of, it's just a measure of a particular kind of rate of change. Okay. Right. But, all right. But it's close to vertical. But it's close to vertical. Another way of thinking vertical. about it, the way to one way to think about it is, OK, you know, um, you had an opportunity where you have proteins and other shit that's bouncing around. And then all of a sudden they get more. And more there's a subset that's getting increasingly complicated in the way it operates. And then all of a sudden you get a cell. Now, that protein change went vertical, basically, and then jumped into the plane of life. And the plane of life then is a qualitative behavioral change shift. Now you're measuring something else that now is changing. So it's not operating on the same rate of change. So the, basically the measurement yeah. and the kind the of evolution that's emerged yeah. is, is done. You know, that system is now not appropriate to, that's not the appropriate lens to understand the rate of change that you're actually interested in. Got you. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I hope I'm not being pedantic here, but to, so just to, to, but to say something goes vertical in this case just means we're now speaking about a different rate of change it, but from this other perspective, it didn't actually go vertical. It just went close enough such that it's relevant to consider pace of change at a different level of real yeah. being, reality, right. complexity. Right. So whatever rate of change that we had now, this the things are happening so differently at this level. It's essentially, essentially infinite. So that would be essentially going vertical. Yeah. Oh, it's so difficult. Look, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to understand, just even try to understand emergence and then and then to try to understand close to <laughs> like in the infinity, like the close to that's so, well, it's so, well, it's so interesting. Well, one way to think about it is imagine that I was trying to train my dog. Okay. Uh, you know, my dog, Benji just wandered around here. Okay. And I can start to ch train him. All right. And train him in basic, Hey, sit and bark. Okay. And I start giving him mm -hmm. words. And he starts learning more and more words and getting faster and faster. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you could start to say, oh my God, he's learning more words quicker and quicker. So if mm -hmm. I had that rate of change, then we would start to say, huh, Benji would go vertical when he would join this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 All yeah. right. So yeah, yeah, by, the, yeah. by the time we're actually measuring, hey, can you learn a new word here in the context of three weeks? This conversation cannot be measured in the idea of, uh, of a co entity that can learn one word every three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. This, it, it's such a fascinating, I mean, for me, this stuff is like, <clears throat> because it, it, if we just plug in the word ethics, it becomes like, okay, how to conceive of the continuity of mattering through, through these vertical changes and right and 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 i i just 
I just wonder, because this is sort of now linking up with some of where my sort of effective energy in the beginning portion of this conversation yeah. is, is kind of going, is I'm always, is there like a way of, is it okay? Because I think most of us would agree that um, there's something in the, like take the idea of the, the, a dog, there's something to a, a right treatment of a dog. Totally. You know? And um, like that, it's so easy to get caught in the, the, the kind of anthropomorphization of our relation with everything, but to get stuck in the, the justification of it without maintaining the through line of the mattering of that, of that valuation. And okay, let's, 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 let's port this over. Cause there's, I mean, I, I'm someone in, in these conversations, I can basically just for a, probably a good four hours until I get tired, just keep on going up, you know? And um, that's, you know, it's interesting. And I, I would enjoy that conversation. And then there's a part of me that's like, okay, actually much of the, well, the building that I'm seeking um, to do with others, that we are doing together um, in a distributed fashion is, um, requires, you know, a foundation. And I think about now the artfulness, for example, of conversation and, and dialogos, um, which is a word I feel, you know, I'm slowly becoming more comfortable using. It was obviously it's a, it's a beautiful word, you know, dialogos and, um, uh, you know, thanks to John Baveki, Christopher Mastro Pietro for, for bringing that word to us. The, the, the dynamic that the dialogos, the word is referencing was something I felt attuned to before I knew the word and might've yeah. just called it transformative conversation, meaningful yeah. conversation or something like this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And there's something in there. It's a, for me, it's just referencing a kind of right relationality of participation in understanding and the mutual transformative process that we undergo as we pay and enact that kind of ethical relationship to ourselves and each other in relationship, of course, with, with, with the world. Mm. And so. Brilliant. Yeah. And so it's, I, let, I, oh God, I'm going up again. I want to extend the dynamic of us being here together. And of course we're using the technology of Zoom. I want to extend, like it seems to me where we're heading, if I look into vision that where we, I say where we must head, like what do I have the right to use that word must? Like what I, it's, it's somehow that same attempt that same care and attention and intention, as you're saying, put towards this mutually transformative ethical process of giving and taking and rhythmically seeing together, so that has to be brought into a broader, I say physical and, you know, just physical context in terms of like an environment, a space totally. where that, it's the, the patterns in nature, some of these, cause we think of this going vertical, it, like you think of like the Fibonacci sequence and yep. how there's so much of, there's, there's like a coherent order to the patterning of things that stuff, the creation seems to have to take in order for its perpet perpetuation. There's a lot of variance with respect to the particulars, but there's something about then how we, how we, not only model, but venerate the creative patterns that nevertheless still inform us, like oh. constitute us, even as we then branch into broader capacities for, you know, this information processing, this kind of, a kind of a coherent pluralism, which all of a sudden the coherence in this pluralistic picture then is not, it's obviously just, it's, it's not just a, a, it's precisely not just a, a radical relativism. It's, 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 it's like, a, it's like a solar system. It's, you know, it's like another level of 
it appears that it's pluralistic from one vantage point, but one wonders once something goes vertical <laughs> in this sense, if all of a sudden it's like, ah, that's the body, that's, that's mm-hmm. the new body, right? And the process is going to continue of how that itself, so that's not final in that sense. But there's, it's just that the ethical participation in what calls, being able to attune to what calls forth in oneself to express and the giving way to someone else, that what one's hearing, but how that can then be extended and really enacted to include the calls of someone with instrument, the calls of someone who's, oh, I just see like vistas of people arrayed in formation with nature. Like when does it come time like that moment of just coming to silence and appreciating the wind blowing through the trees as the sun sets, which all of a sudden becomes like, like we perceive it as the vista of how we somehow fit together as a whole, even though it couldn't be further away in from, uh, you know, like the justification of the proposition at one level of analysis versus that shared feeling and participation in the beauty in this case of nature presented to us as art and mm. like God. And so, so where am I going with this? It's something like the importance, it, but it's, it's like this weird, it's such a, as things speed up, it's like the slowness of that, of that, of that. Ah, oh God, please, please. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that's a, you know, I, I think we can just pause there for a second. Take the wind that you just offered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, I mean, that was a lot, and it's very... So you talk about mattering, a sort of a continuum of mattering. I love that, okay? Yeah. It's actually the tree of knowledge is sort of like, starts at energy into matter, and then it's about mattering at the level of life, mind, culture, and the future. And you can, yeah. really, ha- you can really feel that. And you can then say, well, then it starts to ask, ethical questions, you know, um, and it would be horribly wrong for me to, you know, if I just turned around and viciously killed my dog, <laughs> that would be, you know, right. unbelievably brutal, you know. Yeah. Um, I've left the fish tank open and a few of my fish jumped out and I felt sad about that, but that's yeah. different, right? <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. That's different. So, so I, I'm just saying there, you know, it's like, so there are these unbelievably important ethical questions. Um, and, and we, we need to, there, you just said an enormous number of things there that I, that we can yes. just stay with, which is sort of like, oh my God, we can get a coherent pluralistic view on the one hand. It's not preordained, but it's emerging and sort of clear. It then brings all sorts of ethical considerations, one of the, which we have to stay grounded and stacked across the continuum of mattering and stay connected in love and being to other people anywhere from, you know, my dog and not being pejorative, but actually 95% of the people don't give a, don't think and are not framed in, in this regard. And what I mean by this mm. is a huge level of abstraction, let's face it, in relation. Yep. Most people just live in love. They want to, you know, they're like, hey, I want to have fun. I want to play. <laughs> I want to do my work. I want to love. And, and you mm-hmm. know, and they want to mm-hmm. be in a particular connection and they will find their path to wisdom through love and being good at that level. So, and that's absolutely central. So what this, to me, what we're, there's the, those of us that are, I have often have this um, uh, close encounters of third kind imagery. Uh, I may have shared that in some other context, but, you know, this idea of seeing Devil's Mountain, you know, that's the mountain that like Richard Dreyfuss, I don't know if you know the movie, but he he gets this image. And I certainly Mm -hmm. have felt, at least in connecting with you and John and Jordan Hall and just many other people is that there's a there's a real sense of mountain seers, you know, Mm. Uh, and now and that's a collective zeitgeist that is emerging and that Mm -hmm. there's a strong intellectual you know, and specific kind of spiritual, intellectual, analytic journey, anti-authoritarian, which I share, you know, mm-hmm. kind of tendency that would mm-hmm. then awake to a particular type of moment. And then there is an, there's an art and uh, elitism. There's an elitism to this that we have to, and me, I'm willing to acknowledge at one level, but the whole point in gaining self-conscious awareness of the acknowledgement of elitism is to me, if you're in right relation, the fundamental thing is about wisdom, love, dignity, well-being, integrity, mattering across the systems. I mean, that's the 
That's yeah. got to be, that's the arc that really fucking matters, not how many toys I have when I die. Yep. I mean, that's, you know, yep. that's it. And so if that's the case, then it's a, there is a syncing up, there's an intellectual exercise, there's an embodied authentic exercise, and there's a fundamental grounding of ethics uh, that we need to consider. Um, and all of these are principles and processes we need to take to frame, but will not predetermine this crazy adjacent possible emergence that we may yeah. be looking at in the yeah. next decade. Yep. Yeah. God. Yeah. Thank you for that, Greg. I mean, it feels like, I feel like for those who are still um, with us and, and listening at this point, I, I feel it's worthwhile to say to me what a, like how grateful I am to be able to express myself in this way with you. And, and that it's like to say two things, like one is that like on the one hand, I feel I'm able to, it's, it's not when I'm speaking in a way that can be bringing in so much without probably to many perspectives, tending to and building out the ground all along the way, just kind of calling out there, 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 and all of a sudden spiraling very quickly. To, to, to me, that, that process feels like I can only do that if I, if I, am, if I feel myself grounded. And that, that, might not always, that might not always come across if there's something I've said which doesn't propositionally map to where someone's at, because all of a sudden then it's like, whoo, where are you yeah. off to? Yeah. So it's like the combination of that. Because when when we talk about the ethical stuff and just like it's not to pay it lip service. Like to me, the, whatever is whatever is occurring as I as I seek and speak with a kind of authenticity regarding these matters is the same orientation that has me like attend deeply to matters of, of conscience that yes. are oriented in, in like physical touch and hug mm. and, and, and mm. a tear and, and, and love and these things it's, it's that. And, and so the manifestation of this with you, like for me, it's a gift to be able to say so much stuff and have you, you're there to like go, yes, let's catch in all of these different ways, mm. these other mm. levels. Mm -hmm. Like that, for me, that's, and, and this is why conversation and why ultimately the distribution of, con of conversation is, is so incredible because all of a sudden in the right combination, I can do something. I can follow a calling that comes through me, which seeks like to express authentically and wants to see if I can get at a vision there and have that not be fundamentally ungrounded because right. I can then hold and right. give over and then others can come in to share their perspective and build the whole together. So I just would say to people this, like all of this stuff, all of these conversations to me are, are invitations and they're invitations not to exactly where this is now, but to exactly where we can be together as we say hello. <laughs> yeah, amen. You know? Amen. Yeah. So, in fact, yeah. When we started this conversation, and then, and we can maybe you know start to give the listeners a little bit of a horizon that we can begin to wrap up a little bit, but so that mm -hmm. we don't tax them too brutally. <laughs> mm -hmm. But when we started, when I said, "Hey, let's push this pause." Uh, I was, we were starting to talk about this space, what we were seeing, what happened to us, what yeah. got pulled in. I mentioned, you know, I mean, my experience looking across the horizon in particular, probably more than anyone else with John Verbeke, I mean, it's a remarkable yeah. thing in my, yeah. oh, it's tr transformative to me, uh, not to, you know, stick too much on John and our relation, although it's a very powerful and good thing, but it's really been amazing to me to see another individual climbing up a particular mountain, Mount Meaning mm -hmm. or and Mattering, mm -hmm. and be at a place and be like, oh my God, there is somebody. Mm -hmm. And actually being a bit in the wilderness, we talk about academy and things like that, and being like, feeling like I'm seeing something and being like, nobody else in the, even in the academy, that's why I say it's a unique kind of thing. I mean, I've been yammering about this shit for a long time and I get to have had good individual conversations, but I've never felt that there's a community that is mm -hmm. on the verge of metabolizing similar kinds of processes until mm -hmm. now, until 2018, until some emergence that now 
there is a, there's a meta modern zeitgeist uh, and a transformational view of what we knew in the past and what's happening to us technologically, socially, what is what Zoom does, what, what the COVID crisis is doing. And now all of a sudden, although that's tragic, of course, in many ways, it's also creating potentials. And I believe there's a zeitgeist spiritual potential in a Hegelian, perhaps, absolute spirit sense, any number of possible ways of formulating it that really is engendering these dialogos, you know, moments uh, of connection. And it feels mm -hmm. very right in terms of what the potential is for what we might be able to evolve into society-wise. And what would it be like if we had a, a society where people could find conversation, like-minded, growth-fulfilling, interconnected conversations with various communities uh, that were actually, you know, enriching of the soul and spirit. Yeah. I mean, what would that be yeah. like? <laughs> oh, it would be beautiful. Right? It would be beautiful. Ooh. Yeah. 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 It, and, and, you know, and the way you've articulated that there, I just want to uh, affirm as an articulation of uh, the vision I share um, regarding the things I'm seeking to build. And, yes. um, you know, I know we're, we're looking to, to wrap up here and there's a whole conversation here to be had at a level of expression. That's very, um, I think much closer to the, 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 the psychological, uh, and, and in embodied sort of, um, wounding and, mm. and desire for mm -hmm. connection. Right. Um, and, and just, and, and images of physical spaces, um, mm. and, and music and food and, and mm. nutrition, you know, yes. that is much, I think more in some sense that more, it, it, I, I, that's where so much of my focus is. Um, and, and, and it's not, you know, and I guess I'm saying this because I feel in many ways, actually, I feel a lot of the feeling of failure a lot, you know, mm. I feeling, mm really constantly like I'm failing, uh, mm. often. Um, and mm. you know, we'd need a couple of sessions to get to the bottom of this, but, uh, <laughs> but, <Right. Well> <laughs> but I, I, um, I, I can, I can look at, I can look at, you know, the, the progress and, and development of relationships I've, I've, I've had and, and continue to make. And, um, I, I see though the, I see the importance of doing this together. Um, and I, I see that the, the in, immense importance of collaboration and I am, oh, there's just at the level of funding to the level of like formation of business entities um, and, and the, the relationship between local community and, and ventures with online summits and protocols for interaction and yep. the sharing of artifacts created and the bringing in of animators, the bringing in of all these different multimedia types. And there's so, it's, there's, there's just so much there mm. it, that, that I see and, and just the inadequacy I've had of being able to bring that into being at the level of like pace that I, yep. I feel it, but it's, there is movement and yes. it's, there's so much inadequacy though. It's like, there's such, it's such a long, it's such a long way toward that, toward that vision, you know? Um, yeah. I, I feel, I, I am hopeful. I am hopeful. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you see me spiraling downwards. Right, there. Well, right. I mean, well, let me just, you know, uh, you know, without getting into depth, let me say that as far as I'm concerned, there are a network of people that are threading together something very, very uh, positive. I'd like to think the TOK is one slice of that. I'd like to think Voicecraft is a slice of that. I'd like to think Stoa and Rebel Wisdom and John's work and the Neurohacker Collaborative and Bard's mm -hmm. frame of reference, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's our uh, Lean Rachel Anderson and, and Bill Dome. I mean, we, yep. we can see a community of, of threaders that are weaving together something very, very important, you know? Yep. Um, and 
I mean, listen, and we're right now, let's remember, we're fleas on a fucking ice on the Titanic. <laughs> we're just like, yeah. nah, nah, nah. <laughs> you know, and the Titanic is, you know, it's 7 billion people with infrastructure that is just, uh, you know, completely in, in a particular structure. And we're like getting together and having ideas uh, yeah. and we're talking and there is no way to change the Titanic into a happy cruise ship in <laughs> a couple of years. I mean, it's just not yeah. realistic. So. So I'm super excited about how much conversation has happened is that people are playing around with different spaces, you know, and, yep. and you're clearly doing that. Uh, and there's gotta be a lot of failure. I mean, let's face it, there's an enormous amount yeah. of trial and error. Jason possible shit means everything is changing constantly. There's no way to plan out and not yeah. be, get super lucky if it happens to take off, you know? I know, and yep. uh, I mean, not to for myself, I've been yammering about my ideas for 20 fucking years. <laughs> And I was yeah. like, and I was like, yeah. nobody paid any goddamn attention. And yeah. I was like, hey, maybe some minor people are paying attention, or some. And it's still like, well, you know, it's like whatever, and whatever happens. But I feel like the, there is an emerging collective consciousness that seems to be nudging its way, uh, you know, towards the right direction, finding its way towards the concept of God, as it were. Yeah, yeah, yes. There's definitely that movement. There's definitely that potential. And I am fundamentally hopeful where that hope is a, is the way that hope is grounded in, in the ever present opportunity to, to reaffirm the worthwhileness mm -hmm. of all of this, regardless of what is built. And so in that sense, the, yeah, fortunately my hope isn't grounded in the, success or not of the things I've been able to build. Um, because that's not exactly true, is it? Because the, the cultivation of who we are is in some sense a building from another it angle. We'll be tied in, but um, you know, we can, we can set up another dialogue in relationship to that from you know, the yeah. other aspects. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I very much hope so. And um, there's, there's so many more threads of discussion, uh, particularly into the ethics, the mm -hmm. ethics of the, or the ethics of interaction in the space of the Bard absolute, B A R R E D, in Alexander <laughs> right. Bard's language. Right. For me, this Perhaps is not accidentally, but there it is. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, that's a that's a tease to Bard. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I this is a conversation. I've had a number of conversations with Alexander now, and um, love interacting with him. Such an important thinker, and. Uh, yes much appreciation for his, for his work and synthesis. And there's, it's like something in there just as a nod to the future for, for listeners and those people I know who are right alongside us in their participation in this conversation, something in there in relationship to these dynamics we attune to of this towards and away from and, mm -hmm. affect, and negative and positive and in, in there, and the absolute attunement to that, to that discernment of interaction is like, there's some, there's some really, we, we, have, we have to cultivate this capacity in the most critical of energetic contexts in order for this cohering community to be able to voice shadow fundamentally. Yes. Something like that. Nice. And right. Fair enough. That's something so, on the That's on the beautiful. Hill. I think that that's a, and, and th this, you know, certainly either the one before or whatever when it comes out. But so Bard and I, you know, part of our framing in the, the generally the title was the difference between Enlightenment 2.0, my vision, mm. and Bard's dark renaissance. You know? mm -hmm. um, and that's and then we put those in, you know, our personalities, our limitations, our visions. Um, and what. To me, what the Dialogos is affording is I could imagine in many different times, you know, somebody like me and Bard would be, in, you know, channeled into certain kinds of justifications and be positioned against each other in particular kinds of ways. It seems to me there's a hope for an emerging sensibility, a meta-modernist, whatever kind of sensibility. It's like, oh, Bard, yeah, you do dark renaissance. I do, you know, I'll do my little enlightenment 2.0. And there's, a, there's an opportunity for that real richness without getting channeled into some sort of like alienating mm. hatred, even as we're both visionaries and trying to do our own yep. particular kind of work in the world, but it's done in a particular kind of way that feels, I don't know, it's got 
uh, something that's healthy about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the dark and the light in some of the, in some of the experiences I've had, just the profound imagistic experiences, the, the beauty of the relationship between dark and light, how they meld into each other, that somehow are together and yet distinct in a whole, that there's something like, it's something like the, like the appreciation of the, the appreciation of the being and of the position, like, you know, so someone like Daniel Schmachtenberger will say, you know, there's signal in, in everything. Not, not everything's 100% noise, which is kind of like an, you know, an analytical way to reference something here. I'm looking at poetically, yep. right. but it's um, it's it, the practice of dialogos. Then the practice of that ethics in of of artfulness and in interaction as being what enables these kind of what might look like opposing forces, but that are fundamentally involved in dialogical relationship conceived from another angle as a kind of oneness or a wholeness, whole making is, uh, that's where it's at. And what are the contexts like physical, you know, digital protocol, ritual, archetypes around the table to most enable the generative ends of this coming together. This is, these are ripe questions that I'm actively pursuing. And so many of us are. And so looking forward to where that inquiry takes us for sure. Beautiful. All right. Yeah. Well, that, that, that sounds like a wonderful summation, uh, both of our little journey and the larger mm-hmm. journey. We're mm-hmm. sort of a fractal of. <laughs> cool, man. So Such a privilege, that. honestly. Thank you so much Amen. for being here. Uh, it's uh, honestly just a beautiful thing for me and um, is an honor, really. Thank you, Greg. I really cool. appreciate you being out there, being you. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I look forward to sharing this uh, with folks. Awesome, man. Beautiful. Take care. Take care.